we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to, to, deserve to know. To know. And deserve to know. Welcome to Conspiracy Corner Podcast, everyone. This is Abe, your host. It is 6 a.m. Tuesday, March the 29th, 2022. Um, As far as an update, it's been a pretty chill day. Just been sleeping, watching TV, doing a little bit of reading. Uh, Fixed some salmon with some baked beans. Well, Sammy did. She actually surprised me and woke me up with dinner, so that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, we do like salmon with like dill aioli, um, a sauce that goes on it. It's freaking awesome, dude. Um, besides that, just did some dishes, just been poking around the house, chilling out on my day off. Um, so I had some time, figured I'd do a podcast instead of sitting around watching TV. Might as well do something productive. So let's get on with the show. Today we're getting into the Wild West, um, the haunted Wild West. Me, myself, I'm a boy at heart, you know. I love cowboys and Indians and all that jazz and westerns and stuff. And I also love the paranormal. So, let's get into it. Frontier folklore. Passed down through the generations, these spooky stories add to the eeriness that already permeates the old American West. Wild spirits. Some ghosts just don't want to leave the West. Hear the creepiest curses, hauntings, burial grounds, and more. The Oregon Trail. The pioneers who didn't survive the trek haunted those who came after them. As westward expansion exploded in the early 1830s, a half a million pioneers and their families immigrated via the Oregon Trail. Some didn't make it to their final destination. However, as there were deaths along the way due to disease, starvation, and Indian attacks, in the 1860s, as the first Continental Railroad made the Oregon Trail less traversed, One Nebraska settler came upon a grisly discovery while picking strawberries with his wife on their new property, a human skull. But it wasn't the only one. When he looked closer in the foliage, he found the bones of many other persons. The couple gathered them all, matching skulls with complete bodies, and the result was twelve skeletons, which we judged were a party of immigrants of men, women, and children, said the unnamed man. His family gave them all a proper burial, yet that night they heard an uncanny, uncanny, weird moan or cry, like that of a woman or child in the depths of anguish or despair. The blood-curdling sounds returned night after night, even terrifying the neighbors who dubbed her the Lost Woman Ghost. A year later, the family discovered another ghastly sight, the skeleton of a woman huddled in a crouched, squatting position. Again, they collected the remains and buried her alongside the others. The man wondered, could there be a connection? That night, the rare silence gave him the answer. Was this the spirit of the murdered woman beseeching me to bury her bones besides those we had previously buried? I hope so. 
And if this gave rest to the soul, let it be the end. And it was. Big Nose Kate, Doc Holliday's longtime lover, returns to their old watering hole in Tombstone. She appears at the bar at the Old Crystal Palace Saloon in Tombstone, Arizona. A young woman in period 1800s dress, her eyes scanning the room as if she's waiting for someone. Many believe this is the spirit of Big Nose Kate on the prowl for her beloved Doc Holliday, ready to give him a piece of her mind. Born in Hungary, Mary Horoni immigrated to America, settling in Iowa. Orphaned five years later, the 16-year-old stowed away on a riverboat, bound for St. Louis. By 1874, she was working as a sporting woman in a Kansas brothel before moving to Texas, where she met Holiday. Beginning a stormy alcohol-fueled relationship, the pair bounced around Arizona. She worked as a prostitute under the name Big Nose Kate. He fixed teeth. Finally, making their way to Tombstone in 1880, she reputed size of Kate's schnoz appears exaggerated. Her temper is another story. Doc and Kate loved fiercely and fought volcanically, usually after a hard night drinking in watering holes like the Golden Eagle Brewery. Now, the Crystal Palace. At the time, the OK Corral, Kate was living with Doc in C.S. Fly's boarding house, located just above the landmark, and witnessed the build-up to the legendary shootout, as well as Doc's regret afterwards. Quote, that was awful, Kate quoted him saying as, saying as he sat on a bed and cried. The pair eventually went, on, went their separate ways, with Kate living out her final years in Prescott, Arizona, dying a week before her 91st birthday in 1940. Her name now graces another haunted tombstone landmark, Big Nose Kate Saloon built on the site of the fire-damaged Grand Hotel, where she and Doc used to stay. But her spirit favors the nearby Crystal Palace. Over the years, there have been multiple accounts of a woman, provocatively dressed, and believed to be Kate, standing around at the bar, then vanishing suddenly. Bat Masterson the famed gunslinger turned sports writer returns to haunt his hotel watering hole. A stay at the St. James Hotel in Cimarron, New Mexico, promises the full historic Southwest experience with vintage decor, bison heads mounted on the walls, and for some, spectral encounters with the greatest lawman and gunfighter of all time. Bat Masterson's spirit has been known to make a surprise and noisy visits. A dashing figure in his bowler hat, well-cut suits and pocket watches, Bartholomew Bat Masterson was born in Quebec, but his family settled in Wichita, Kansas. As a teenager, sorry, I got a crazy kitty. <laughs> Bat left the farm with his brothers for frontier adventures. As a railroad laborer, he learned the value of a gun when he had a, the strong arm, 300 bucks, and back wages from his boss. A few years later, he was elected sheriff at Ford County, Kansas, to keep the peace in the rough and tumble cow town. He left for a brief stint dealing faro with White Earp and Tombstone but was summoned back to Dodge to unravel a dispute between his brother Jim, a saloon owner, and a bartender he'd fired. A gun battle broke out, and the offender was wounded, but nobody knew by whose gun. Though blame fell on Bat and Jim, they were fined $8 and driven out of town. Imagine that, just being fined $8 and kicked out of town for a gun battle. Now you'd be locked up and... Go to prison, <laughs> you know. 
For the next two decades, Bat roamed the West until, in 1902, he wound up in New York City working as a newspaperman, pounding out sports stories for the city, city's The Morning Telegraph, while rubbing elbows with celebs fascinated with his colorful life. On October 25, 1921, Bat wrote his last column and died at his desk at the age of 67. Although he was buried in the Bronx, he can't stay away from his old watering holes, like the St. James Hotel. His namesake room is a popular reservation, where guests say they've heard bats stumbling across, stumbling across the floor, knocking over glasses, and rummaging through the ice bucket. Apparently, just as thirsty in the afterlife. Thomas Blackjack Ketchum the train robber met a grisly end during a mishap in the gallows. Union County, New Mexico, has had only one hanging in its history, which is probably for the better considering how it turned out. As Thomas Blackjack Ketchum plunged through the open chute, the noose squeezed his neck, and his head snapped clear off. The world's most unfortunate condemned man and his brother Sam founded the Ketchum Gang before joining Butch and the Sundance Wild Bunch. Although Thomas, by now, taking the nickname Blackjack, missed the gang's most infamous and disastrous holdup in, 19, in 1899. A gunfight erupted and left Sam dead. Unaware of what had happened, Blackjack attempted to rob the same train by himself, but the conductor greeted him with a shotgun blast to the arm. He stumbled to his horse, but he was too weak to mount it, and he was arrested. Convicted of felonious assault upon a railway train, he was led up to the gallows on April 26, 1901. The inexperienced hangman practiced multiple times using a 200-pound sandbag, which he forgot to unhook. And when Black Jack's body dropped, the added weight caused the rope to slice through his neck. Only the hood pinned to his shirt kept his head from rolling away. The Colt's Curse Samuel Colt's family endured tragedies blamed on his deadly weapons. A marvel of machinery, the Colt pistol revolutionized the industry. It could be reloaded without having to disassemble, making it fast, efficient, and deadly. In 1847, Samuel Colt began selling his revolvers to the U.S. government and around the world, harboring no concerns that his creations were mass-killing machines. All that mattered was the guns made him rich. They may have also cursed his family. Within 15 years, two of Colt's children died in infancy. A third passed away at the age of three. And in 1862, the patriarch himself expired at 47 years old from gout. But it didn't end there. His 35-year-old son later drowned at sea. How could so many untimely tragedies devastate one family? Some have attributed it to Colt's ruthlessness and role in the violent deaths of those on the receiving end of his firearms. But the most notorious trouble surrounded his brother John, who was convicted of murdering and mutilating his business partner, whose corpse was found naked, hogtied, and stinking in a ship's cargo hold. The case generated headlines around the world and inspired Edgar Allan Poe's The Oblong Box. Honestly, man, that reminds me of uh, the Winchester, uh, Sarah Winchester and their family curse, you know. Yellow Jacket Mine. The worst mining accident in Nevada history continues to spook locals. On the morning of April 7th, 1869, dozens of men went to work inside Yellow Jacket Mine in Gold Hill, Nevada, never to return home to their families. Within hours, an uncontrollable methane fire broke out at the 800 foot level, incinerating the wooden framing and collapsing the tunnels.
trapping everyone inside, some of who remain sealed away inside the mind to this day, according to witnesses. The souls of at least 11 of the 35 to 40 deceased made it out, yet are struck, stuck wandering the surrounding property as ghosts. The cause of the fire remains a mystery. Theories range from accidental and unattended lantern to a proposal purposeful evil planned by a greedy man who hoped to cash the market on silver. To crash the market on silver. Sorry. What is known is that the inferno raged for days, stoked by the abundance of natural gas until the burning tundal, tunnels were sealed off to prevent further spread. Even eerier, for years after, miners claimed they could still feel the heat through the walls as they worked. More than 130 years later, many of the lost souls haunt the mine, as well as the Gold Hill Hotel that sits below. Unexplained lights and glowing orbs of blue and white have been reported near the shaft's entrance. And the faint sound of cries for help can be hear, heard coming from deep inside the mine. At night, their apparitions walk the ground as if they are heading off to work. And every year, on the anniversary of the tragedy, they appear in full force. The strange and unexplained. The, the West wasn't just wild, it was downright weird, as some of these tales prove. Elmer McCurdy's Traveling Corpse Considerably more famous in death, failed bank robber Elmer McCurdy was shot and killed in 1911 <clears throat> while nursing a hangover in a hay shed. When nobody claimed his body, an undertaker pumped him full of embalming fluid, dressed him in a suit, put a rifle in his hand, and charged a nickel to see the bandit who wouldn't give up. In the 1970s, the cor corpse turned up in Southern California Funhouse, where a member of the TV crew shooting the $6 million man accidentally no knocked off Elmer's arm and discovered it was not a wax dummy as thought. Elmer was cleaned up and given a proper burial with star Lee Majors attending the funeral. Alien Abduction in Stock Stockton, California on November 17th, 1896, Northern California got a close encounter, according to the Sacramento Bee. Quote, Most startling exhibition was seen in the sky. A giant airship surrounded by a blue light. A man named H.G. Shaw claimed he came across three warbling, naked, seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials with big eyes. As the story got picked up around the country, Thousands of more witnesses reported similar and even more outrageous experiences until the mania ended as quickly as it had begun. The Ship of Death One day in 1882, a trapper gazed upon Wyoming's Plate River and out of the haze emerged a decrepit sailing vessel with frost-covered mast and a crew of frozen ghouls. The next day, his fiancée died. Several others over the decade have come forward with similar accounts of this ship of death that carries away an unlucky soul close to its beholder. So when the fog descends, it's best to look away. Joaquin Marietta The famed desperado's head went on traveling display after he was killed by rangers. Sleepy Hollow holds no monopoly on headless horsemen. A shadowy figure has been spotted galloping through the Southern California foothills, shouting, Give me back my head! The horseman in question is Joaquin Marietta, a notorious desperado, both feared and beloved. In his time and ever since, considered by some the Robin Hood of the West, by others, a good-for-nothing robber and killer. Little is known about Marietta. Some sources trace him back to Sonora, Mexico, 
where he was raised before being drawn to California during the 1840s gold rush. In most versions, Marietta's life turned horribly tragic after his wife was brutally raped and his brother was hanged on a false charges. He became an outlaw, robbing stages and killing Anglos who crossed him. A $6,000 reward was put on his head, with which would explain why it didn't stay affixed for long. In 1853, California Rangers tracked him down and decapitated him, picking his head, pickling his head in a jar and putting it on display in a traveling show charging a dollar to see. The head eventually wound up in a San Francisco museum, but was lost in the 1906 earthquake. Activists consider Marietta a symbol of resistance against racist mistreatment. As for his ghost, it inhabits the foothills of Piru, north of Los Angeles. Silver Heels The dancer with a heart of gold mourned those she couldn't save. They called her Silver Heels because of the fancy shoes she wore as a dance hall girl in the Colorado mining camp of Buckskin Joe. As mysterious as she was alluring, she kept her face hidden behind a mask, and no one ever discovered her identity. But one thing they all could agree on, she was the kindest soul, so beloved for her generosity, they named a mountain after her, a special place where her spirit still returns. Nothing is known about where Silver Hills came from before she stepped out of a stagecoach around 1860 in the boom town where she entertained men at saloons and gambling halls. In the winter of 1861, a smallpox epidemic swept through Buckskin Joe. The women and children fled to Denver while the miners stayed behind to protect their claims. Silver Hills also refused to leave. Donating her earnings to doctors and personally nursing friends, neighbors, and customers until she too became sick. When the epidemic passed, Silver Heels was never the same, said to be devastated by the scars on her face from smallpox, and she quietly left Buckskin. Quote, the best we could do was to name the mountain after her, said U.S. Marshal. Frank H. Mayer, and so today the 13,829 foot peak in front range of the Rocky Mountains is called Mount Silverheels, perhaps the only geological feature named after a dance hall girl. While Buckskin Joe recovered from the epidemic, the gold ran out by 1866, and the mining hamlet turned into a ghost town. But in the shadow of the Mount of Mount Silverheels at Buckskin Joe's Cemetery, there have been sightings of a woman in a black veil putting flowers on graves of smallpox victims who appear wherever someone gets close. The Last Pony Express Station The riders come thundering in from the afterlife in this relic of a bygone era. In 1860, Advertisements like this one began appearing in Western newspapers. Wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders, willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. A flurry of applicants responded, all seeking adventure, working for the famed Pony Express. In only 18 months, however, the era ended and the final rider hung up his spurs at the last stop outside Hanover, Kansas. But the strange sounds and eerie phenomenons at Hollenberg Station suggest some have returned for one last delivery. Traveling up to a hundred miles a shift, a rider got a horse every ten miles from the station stop, then handed off, relay fashion to another. They braved rough terrain, foul weather, and Indian attacks. For this, 
they made $100 a month. At its peak, 190 stations lined the 1,900-mile 1, route. But as the telegraph lines stretched across the West, delivering news and information instantaneously, the Pony Express collapsed. In the end, there was only Hollenberg, which shut down in 1861, but is kept standing as a museum where the past returns. Visitors report hearing hooves approaching the station and men shouting. Inside, cold spots are felt. Some believe this is the spirit of the original owner, Garrett Hollenberg, a playful ghost who drifts in after hours to rearrange things. El Muerto, the Headless Horseman. The decapitated bandito keeps on riding through the Texas nights. Listen carefully on a moonless night in South Texas, as a couple did in 1917. And the sound is unmistakable, thundering horse hooves at full gallop. As the couple sat next to their covered wagon under the stars, they got a glimpse of a gray horse with a rider, but something was missing, just above the shoulders. The headless horseman, known as El Muerto, the dead one, has been sighted for generations, most recently in 1969, near Freer. This macabre vision is said to be the ghost of a Mexican bandito named Vidal, who made the fatal mistake of stealing prized Mustangs belonging to Texas Ranger Creed Taylor, who chased him down. To set an example for anyone else thinking of messing with Taylor's horses, the Rangers lopped off Vidal's head and tethered it, with the sombrero still attached to the saddle of the horse which was smacked and sent running, ranchers eventually buried Vidal's remains, yet his spirit rides on. Hotel Congress, the lady in room 242. She's just one of the poltergeists who refuses to leave this Arizona hotel. Spend a night in room 242 of the Hotel Congress in Tuscon, Arizona, and you just might wake up next to a strange lady. A woman in a flowing white dress has been known to occupy the foot of the bed. Sounds familiar. We've covered ladies in white who show up at people's, the end of people's beds. And she's not the only visitor from the beyond. This hotel has survived fire, the Dillinger gang, and more than a few hauntings. It was built to serve passengers arriving at the Southern Pacific train depot located behind it. And today the Congress promises every nook and cranny of the hotel reveals a window to years past. With rotary phones, iron beds, and old fashioned radios. According to Connor Gossel of Instagram's Haunted Historian, quote, it has a lot of such ugly and dark stories from murders and suicides that a lot of people over the course of decades, over the course of a century, have reported experiencing and every staff member that currently works here has first-hand knowledge of encountering. One of the most notorious stories went down in 1934 when John Dillinger and his gang chose the Congress as their temporary lodgings after a string of bank heists. But, a fire that started in the basement sent the gangsters scrambling down ladders and eventually into the custody of the law. As for the hotel, it was repaired and carried on. Guests flocking to its famous taproom bar, like the dapper, top-hatted man who inhabits the lobby, or the spirit in a maid uniform who can't stop cleaning. Then, there's a mischievous one in room 219 that keeps locking the bathroom door from the inside. Or a man named Vince in room 220, who died in 2001 after 36 years of living at the hotel. To this day, he still sticks to his morning routine of coffee and a bagel, leaving a dirty plate and cup outside his former room for housekeeping to collect. 
Restless burial grounds, venture into these western graveyards at your own risk. Virginia City Silver Terrace Cemeteries. A headstone glows and blue lights hover over the wooden markers and stone monuments in this hillside graveyard in Nevada, where hundreds of dreams ended six feet under. Few of the city's elite occupy Silver Terrace. This is the final resting place for ordinary miners and merchants, which is why it makes sense. One resident ghost himself is a laborer, the old groundskeeper. John Wesley Harden's grave. Gunned down in a saloon, Harden lies in Cornicordia Cemetery in El Paso, Texas. His grave a magnet for shot glasses, bullet cartridges, coins, and other goodies. Offerings for a man whose renown only grew when Bob Dylan sang about him. At night, Hardin is said to join the other gunslingers in his dusty old burial ground, looking for one more score to settle. Spyro Mounds Anyone who dares to desecrate the Native American burial mounds in Oklahoma can expect a swift and strange death like the grave robber in 1936 who was found drowned in a stream bed that hadn't seen water in a month. Visitors say the spirits watching over this 80-acre landmark make themselves known every full moon in the form of blue lights in the sky. Serving up spirits. These bar patrons and hotel guests still linger in the afterlife long after last call. The Silver Dollar Saloon, Leadville, Colorado. The noose hanging from the rafters has been known to suddenly start swinging wildly, even though there's not a hint of a breeze. The phenomenon is attributed, attributed to reports of a mob once hanged a man inside the bar back in the 1880s. Originally called the Board of Trade Saloon, the tavern was opened in 1879 by mining baron Horace Tabar to serve silver miners who flocked to Leadville seeking their fortunes. Renamed the Silver Dollar in 1935, the bar now welcomes tourists and ghost hunters who have also spotted the spirits of Horace and his tragic wife, Baby Doe Tabor, who was found frozen to death in her nearby cabin. <clears throat> the Bullock Hotel, Deadwood, South Dakota. After a career as the first sheriff of Deadwood, Seth Bullock built his namesake hotel in 1896, offering first-class accommodations in a hard scrabble town. He's so proud of the establishment, he's been known to return now and then revealing his presence by the lingering odor of his favorite cigars. Despite the posted no smoking signs, Bullock's heavy feet can be heard stomping across the floors of the three-story hotel, and some believe they spotted his reflection in mirrors. White Eagle Saloon and Hotel in Portland, Oregon. What's a Chinese ghost doing in a Polish bar? In the context of the rich history of Portland's waterfront, it makes total sense. Opened by a pair of Polish brothers in 1906, the White Eagle served as the unofficial headquarters of the city's Polish population for decades. A White Eagle appears on Poland's flag. For a time, the saloon employed a tough Chinese bouncer who was said to still protect the property more than a century later. Though his vision is not the only eerie phenomenon, guests also report seeing objects flying around and toilets flushing on their own. St. James Hotel in Cimarron, New Mexico. As the scene of at least 26 murders, it's no surprise that St. James Hotel is crawling with paranormal activity. Originally, Lambert's Inn Saloon when it opened in 1872. The establishment, a go-to for notable names like Jesse James, Buffalo Bill, Cody, Black Jack Ketchum, and Billy the Kid, as well as travelers of the Santa Fe Trail, 
was so synonymous with violence, it wasn't uncommon to hear, Who was killed at Lambert's last night? Around Cimarron. More than a century later, at least three guests refused to check out. In room 18, where Thomas James Wright was shot to death after he had won the hotel in a poker game, his spirit is so malevolent that the door must be locked at all times and no one is allowed to book, book it due to safety concerns. Next door in room 17, Mary Elizabeth Lambert, wife of the first owner, has been spotted accompanied by the scent of her signature rose perfume. Throughout the hotel, original furnishings abound, including the antique bar from Lambert Saloon located at the downstairs dining room, 22 bullet holes still visible in the pressed tin ceiling. Big Nose Kate's, Tombstone, Arizona. A few doors down from the Crystal Palace, Big Nose Kate's Old Haunt, another saloon named in her honor, is just as overrun with rowdy spirits. Spectral cowboys have been seen hanging out near the stairs or knocking over cases of beer in the basement. One bar employee claims she felt cold, clammy hands around her throat. And it wasn't just an overserved patron upset about being cut off. Others inside the spooky saloon have heard phantom singing and talking in empty rooms. Witnessed silverware flying off tables and spotted inexplicably blurs on cameras. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe. Sorry. We are as a people. Inherently and historically. Opposed to secret society. Opposed to secret oaths. Opposed to secret proceedings. Secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes. Or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.